So I would like to kick this off, Eric, by asking you about, you know, what what are the things that draw you to certain artworks? And you've done a lot of curating over your career, um, you know, stealing the bread out of the mouths of poor curators, but mm. passons. Um, what, what are you looking for when you look for a work of art? Um, well, I, I definitely uh, start out with uh, a, a general theme, right? And, and I, what I tend to see in the art world, especially these days, I mean, obviously, if we go deeper into history, that there's more narrow focus on thematic, stylistic uh, consistencies, et cetera. Now, nowadays, it's, you know, every man for himself when it comes to handling the making of an object, an art object. So what, what seems to have emerged is uh, uh, that there's underlying themes that uh, uh, grab us all. And uh, and so, you know, to sort of, I mean, this is an obvious case here in that, uh, you know, the theme is, you know, starts out as uh, I, art about water uh, without an idea of, you know, d you know, how narrow or broad it is. But it just, uh, for me, it was about, you know, let's, let's say water, let's start looking for water. And... Uh, and the you know the pleasure of working with you is one you have vast knowledge of, especially with the the you know modern contemporary arts and stuff like that, greater than my range, because basically I hate artists, so <laughs> you know I try, try, try not to you know pay too close attention to how good they are. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but uh, the. Uh, the thing is to you know begin to uh, sort of identify different strains because uh, what you get is you get sub themes as well, and uh, and then within that you also get this incredible range of you know handling objects, how to make something either by hand or have something that is seems to take the hand out of it or th that kind of. Thing. So, uh, you know, I think our, our general thing when we came up with this thing of water was the appropriateness of place. So we live in a, a town that has a historical, deep historical connection as well as a geological one to water. So there's, a, there's an immediate sort of identification attached to that. And, uh, and so that part of it made it easy. Um, I'd also like to say that, uh, which to me bears repeating, and, and someone said earlier today, you did, that you were just thrilled by the variety of ways that artists handled this thing. And, and w what I'm hoping is that, uh, you know, a, a public that's not even an art public, but, uh, but uh, has some kind of curiosity about it, comes in feeling empowered by the fact that they also know a lot about water and uh, or cars, which was our big show last summer, things like that, and then sees the way artists are handling something that they know a lot about but never thought of themselves. Because when, they, when you get into that relationship, you actually get into where art shows up. And, and you get into a, a, a sort of expanding sense of, you know, how to articulate something, how to, how to codify it, how to use it to ex in exchange, social exchange, et cetera, et cetera, moving forward. So anyway, that's kind of it. So I'm going to push you on this a wee bit more. Okay. Um, because we just did a public conversation with Ross Blechner, the painting, which is behind you and you know what I really loved Eric was was the way you on a sort of um, material level had that conversation with Ross and instead of sort of going over that 
I would like you and I to look at the Ansel Kiefer and talk about, to try to see through your eyes what you see in that painting. I mean, when we talked about it, I mean, we, we knew about this painting, we had, you know, the great generosity of the local collector who lent it to us. And for me, what I found exciting was certainly the materiality on the canvas, but what I also loved is the fact that it has this really specific title, which is I Hold All Indias in My Hand, which is about the finding the passage through India past the Cape of Good Hope. So it has this really specific historical title. Which is credited with Vasco da Gama, Vasco right? da Gama, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet the painting itself is rather generic. It's, it's not a, a purely historical image. And so for me as an art historian, with the training of an art historian, I look at that and, and those are the sort of issues that I find interesting. But I would like to hear a little bit from you as a painter, when you look at that, what are the things that interest you? Well, uh, the, the first thing I do when I look at this painting or I look at a lot of Kiefer paintings is to also look where I can get a drink of water. <laughs> Because they are, they ha are a, s a surface that is so dry, right? So physical, so dry that I think, you know, and, and the irony, of course, is that this is about water and, uh, and has very little sort of water ness to it uh, in its physicality. It, it, it has a, a motion to it that, uh, that I think is you know, clearly what he's going for. Uh, you know, so this sort of wave, whirlpool, eddy kind of thing. If you notice around the figure that's in the water, there's a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a swirl mm -hmm. around it and stuff. The, uh, um, but I, you know, I, I, I wasn't aware of the uh, connection, the specific uh, connection to the, the da Gama uh, quote, <clears throat> but uh, uh, having that, it didn't. It it didn't take me in a clear direction, no, even knowing that. And what compels me about the work itself is that you have this figure, which doesn't necessarily uh, show up immediately when you're looking. So it's not like, uh, uh, it's, it's almost, well, let me put it another way. When you look at, at, at paintings, uh, you should always notice what you see first, second, third, fourth, et cetera, et cetera, because the, that's, the artist is actually composing along those lines. So you'll know hierarchically what you know, where you're supposed to look first, second, third, what their meanings might be prioritized along that way. And, and so in this, it, it, you know, the, the body that you come on, the, the figure in the water, at first appears like the other landforms. And so, you know, in, uh, you know close looking, you go, but then he's got some arms and a, maybe that's a head, a bald head or, you know, whatever. It's, something begins to, to take it into that sort of floating thing. And then, the, then I, I sort of, I can't decide whether this is a drowned person, right? It's evocative of both a floating person, a drowned person, so, something that either way, whether it's a, a leisure sort of, you know, thing of just floating in water, or whether it's a, a more tragic uh, aspect, uh, at, at first doesn't sort of explain the, the connection to having discovered mm -hmm. the route to the Indies, you know, that which you would think in terms of, uh, you know, mercantile capitalism and the, the whole nature of that kind of ex exploration you would think of would be celebratory, yep. right? So we're, we're, we're looking at something that I is, uh, is Kiefer, you know, sort of imposing a, a post-colonial, uh, post-capitalist, you know, sort of interpretation 
of what was a momentous event uh, by, you know, sort of the, 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 the arid, the, the barrenness of, of the, the place and then the, the, the possibility of a, a, you know, dead person in there or something. Anyway, it all, it all sort of is something that takes me down these different paths that then I, you know, doesn't finalize my interpretation. It, it, it keeps it open. So I keep going back with that meditation, but uh, without really being able to tie it down. W what do you think? I mean, one of the things that really drew me to the painting is the very high horizon line. The fact that for a painting that is called I Hold All, the, All Indias in My Hand, there's just this tiny sliver of sky and there is a inherent claustrophobia that sort of comes with that. The fact that there's no openness to it, despite the fact that you just don't know if you are in you know, the high seas, if you're on a sort of coastline, if this person is alive or dead. And, you know, this is a sort of example of where I think you and I arrive at um, places of interpretation which are similar, but I'm always interested in how we get there in different ways. Mm -hmm. And what is that way you got there that's different <laughs> from mine? <laughs> um, I did the research on the title. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so when um, De Gama found, so, so he is the first individual who took his boat and managed to get around the Cape of Good Horn um, into the Indian Ocean and to the Indian subcontinent. And supposedly he is, he said, I hold all Indias in my hand. And the reason he said Indias plural is to do with the fact that um, in the European thinking, there were plural Indias. There was the Indian subcontinent, there was the Middle East, and then there were the Spice Islands. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that together was like all of the great spices, the, the, the gemstones, the, all of these important things came from that area. And so they all held this kind of mythical idea. But it, it is essentially, supposedly, his declaration of success and triumph, having finally rounded the Cape of Good Hope, which of course is a terrible, terribly dangerous passage. May I say something? Of course. When you look, when I look at that painting, I didn't know the title. The idea of what happens to water when you go below a continent, you have water that are very thin. Mm -hmm. so Yes, I, I, mm. I think so. And I can't tell you if he started with the title or he started with the piece, but the fact that the title is inscribed onto the painting, um, I'll bet in, I'll, in German, um, does mean that for him it's a kind of essential part to it. Mm -hmm. At the top, in yeah. the very small space. Yeah, <laughs> you can hardly yeah. see it up there. And then the other part of it is that the, there's these uh, lead threads that both attach to each of the land masses and somehow go back into one of the hands there. As so it's as though he's tethered to those different places. And you'll also notice at the top a, a, a tether that goes to the horizon. So it, it kind of is charting his journey through these different uh, land masses. The, uh, by the way, the, uh, if you haven't seen in today's uh, New York Times online, there's an incredible uh, piece on uh, Dutch still life, a very particular Dutch still life from 1635 that connects very directly to the, the, the time in which 
you know, the discovery of the Spice Islands, the, the uh, you know, the trade system, et cetera, and the still life has like all of these elements in it that, you know, it's, it's kind of presented as, uh, you know, half eaten, half peeled, tipped over, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a sort of post feast kind of thing, but everything in there is from a different place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, 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 the oysters come from the, the Baltic Sea, the, the uh, glass comes from Venice, the uh, uh, these li lemon comes from Spain, the salt comes from the salt, uh, you know, so the Spice Islands or something, I forget what, the pepper comes from the yep. Spice Islands for sure, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes through and charts one the the sort of you know Dutch celebration of their you know incredible uh, uh, wealth through through uh, trade and and shipbuilding, and at the same time teetering on the edge of uh, kind of you know inevitable collapse. So and and this is 1635. So they had 50 more years to go. So yeah, honey. Yeah, the opposite of it, yeah, yeah. E.T., you have a question? And, and I see the hazards of going around the Cape. I mean, I think this is what he's, expl I think he's, he's telling us, and I would then think that that was a dead body you know, of someone trying to get around and wasn't able to. Mm. Many, many times they tried, and yeah. they didn't until they found a certain passageway, because the currents were going in every di direction. Right. And that's what it showed, and that's what I think those, they look like rocks or some kind of, you know, they're going to run into all this, all kinds of stuff. A lot of people died. A lot of people died, yes. So I think there's a lot of death in this show. I mean, to be honest, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. we've got, you know, the Bertinsky, which shows the ravages of the oil industry on Nigeria. We have Yinkashan Ibari's piece, which is about, it's called The Wanderer. It is, this is a Nigerian British artist um, building a model of the last ship to bring enslaved people to the United States in contravention of the national laws of this country. Um, with, with Dutch inspired fabric with, with, for the for With the Indonesian, sale. Dutch, African yeah. inspired fabrics. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, you know, we have that. We, we have the um, uh, Dingstra self portrait upstairs, which is set in a uh, um, in a, a Berlin uh, swimming pool, but yeah, there's a, a huge house. amount, a bathhouse, yeah. but there's a huge amount of anxiety, and as somebody, an artist who is Jewish, th there are obviously overtones of the Holocaust well, in it. Well, if you look at the sprinklers above, they're the same sort of configuration as a gas chamber, so. Jeremy's piece is talking about, you know, the destruction of the Shinnecock Nation and the taking of um, land. What else can I happily well, you bring can, up? Uh, we got, uh, <laughs> we have uh, the Thornton Dial around yeah. the corner, which uh, which is a, what, what's the title of that? The uh, ocean bottom rising. of the ocean, ocean rising, which which is full of debris of you know uh, 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 empty shells and stuff like that, and the indication of a uh, of a uh, s some kind of middle form that uh, evokes a tortoise or something, but, you know, endangered in some way. And so the first, qu the first question was, um, how much were we aware of that? And the second one was sort of mother images. 
Um, I would say I was not aware of the death. I mean, I think looking at the Doug Aiken, that kind of exploding sun or the sun flare, you know, there was a sense of destruction, um, maybe global destruction, but the, no, that's really something that came to me during this talk. Um, and then I think the Yinka Shonabari and certainly the uh, Landau, those certainly have Mother Earth figures, as does Linda Alpern's work upstairs. Eric? Yeah, I wasn't thinking about mothers in that w way, so. You were thinking about watery women? Yeah, yeah. watery wenches, I Watery believe. wenches. Watery wenches. <laughs> Isn't that a Monty Python It term? is a Monty yeah. Python. <laughs> Uh, it comes out. Yeah. Oh. So water is, uh, you know, usually interpreted in, you know, a lot of symbol interpretation as, you know, mother images as most mythology, and it's very striking in this show that that's not not you know strongly represented here. So I'm thinking of you know, the way curation happens, um, it can start with a theme and then how it builds. Yeah. And what are the associations? Well, the, I, I think I was sort of moving along a, a lines of, uh, you know, where you, you approach uh, 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 nature as vulnerable from this point of view, you know, this time and the, the vulnerability of it, and then sort of uh, seeing art that moved directly into an expression of or a confrontation with the, uh, the, the tragedy or the anger, the, the emotional content of, uh, you know, that uh, destruction or that loss or the, the vulnerability that it creates in us was part of it, and then, and then there was like a, a, a desire to move away from that to reassert a, an integrity as an affirmation of, of uh, nature itself, and, and to, to do that through things like uh, April's painting here, which is a, a one that, uh, you, you know, has a, a, such a profound sense of the specialness of place that that it that and it, you enter into a uh, an intimate personal relationship to that place it's a, it's not generalized in any way as a, a as a statement of this or that or whatever it's it's about a uh, an awareness that you're with something larger than yourself that has a refinement and a quality and, and that is, I, I think, uh, you know, bring, brings you into a, a kind of a spiritual uh, relationship to place. Uh, and, you know, the longo here is, a, is to me a, an image of, uh, you know, pure nature power that is reinforced by the fact that it's handmade, which blows my mind in, uh, in that, uh, that people can actually draw that, you know? <laughs> I think it's quite amazing. So you're, you're, again, you're looking at something that is elevating your sense of self that is to be human uh, in relationship to something that is uh, not human, but is nature and, and uh, you know, the power thereof, et cetera. So it's, it's that, and then, you know, me being me, and, uh, you know, I think uh, Sara shares in the, 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 you know, looking for comic relief from the high and the low, so, you know, finding a Warhol piss painting where, and thinking, well, that counts as water, you know? I mean, it's waste, but it's water. And the formality of this huge kind of swirl over here, you know, with the swirl of the longo, it was just really fantastic to see those together. And, you know, then to have the longo also in dialogue with the Clifford Ross, where you're looking at 
you know, one that looks photographic and one that perhaps looks more painterly. Um, I would like to go back to April's painting and say that, you know, I would like to give my deep gratitude to April because this is the only representation of water we have in the show where water isn't blue. And for me as an art historian, that's really important because the idea of blue appears to be quite recent. It appears to be kind of something in the Middle Ages because if you have read Homer and um, the uh, Odysseus, they constantly call it the wine dark sea. So it does appear that it, the idea of blue is a, a more um, a more recent color. I think the, um, the, the Greeks didn't even have a word blue. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't. So yeah. it, it's really for me that was something which was really exciting to find a representation of water that didn't rely on blue. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the exciting things about including April's painting. Yeah. One of the um, uh, sort of nice juxtapositions uh, in terms of hanging in the show that I'd like to draw your attention to is the Malcolm Morley painting upstairs next to the Lauren Harris painting. Uh, they're, they're, they're both about uh, uh, exploration and uh, the, the Morley painting is, it's not explicitly a kind of uh, you know, Columbus discovering the new world thing, but it's along those lines of, uh, uh, you know, a ship coming on to a, uh, a new land of some kind. Not to mention it's going to be a, a rough landing <laughs> when, <laughs> when they arrive. But uh, there, there's something about that and also the scale of the boat, and which, you know, l you know leads to the epic nature of, of the uh, journey, and next to that is this Canadian painter, Lorne Harris, who painted in the uh, teens, 20s, 30s, uh, who was part of uh, uh, a group of painters, both American and, uh, and Canadian, who went out into nature with a different sense of purpose than the, the grandeur, the depiction of grandeur, the de depiction of uh, natural power, et cetera, et cetera. They, they actually went out into nature to find an, a deeply personal, abstracted relationship to natural forms that both trans transform, transport you out of the place and locate you in it simultaneously. And in that little painting up there, he's, uh, he's up in the Arctic. And it's you know, kind of I interesting that, that within our imaginations, the Arctic can be quite spectacular, quite grand, quite you know, dramatic in its forms and whatnot. And, and when you see that, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's almost like a, a furry kitten or something of a, of a relationship to this place. And, and I, I just find those two to be an interesting kind of quiet dialogue that's uh, going on. I have to say, I mean, one of the things that really interests me with the Harris um, is what I see as a relationship between his work and George O'Keefe's work. This idea of taking a modernist vocabulary um, and which was developed in cities, which was a lot about urban centers and then taking it out to nature. And this way of kind of investing, this new way of looking at um, these extreme environments. For George O'Keefe, it was New Mexico and it was the desert. And for Harris, it was the, the, the north. north of Canada. And that's incredibly exciting to see that. But there is a, um, e there's a cuteness to it, which I don't mean as an insult. I think of it like a Japanese cuteness. There's a kind of um, desire to stylize its grandeur. This is not a 19th century idea of making nature into this like overwhelming presence. This is, this is almost a kind of, um, I'm sorry, I'm really grasping for words, um, but there's, there's a way of trying to sort of, I feel, bring it closer um, and, and bring it into the modern the, world. That group of artists, you, you think of Marston Hartley or Arthur Dove, yep. um, um, you know, 
the uh, Lauren Harris, et cetera. You mentioned Georgia O'Keeffe. There are many others that were dealing with European abstraction at the time. Uh, can, you know, modernist abstraction. They were they were reluctant to let go of certain aspects of depiction uh, in relationship to abstraction, but they were also finding these incredible sort of shape and compositional things that were happening that were absolutely tied to nature itself, to landscape specifically, not to, not to figuration, but to landscape itself and, and using that. And so, so the, the, to me, it's a very compelling time of uh, art in, in the way you can feel the tension between the, the, the grasping, the letting go, the, the, the pushing, you know, the, the, that whole experimentation that, that still, you know, it, it precedes the, the abstract expressionists which, you know, were willing to let it all go, right, in a way to, to really release it from from any kind of description descriptive nature uh, to move it into pure form abstraction materiality that kind of thing that that this is right before that and and be, being pushed by the European advanced thinking about what painting was and stuff it's I, I don't know there there's something that's very particularly North American about this work that I find interesting, so. Um, I'd also like to talk, speaking of Mother's Day, uh, there are three uh, photographs along the back wall. Uh, behind this wall is a Sally Mann uh, image of her daughter uh, in this sort of halo of whiteness with her Curly long hair floating, radiating out, um, and the and the daughter's face staring sort of blankly out at you. And then, in the middle is uh, Siglit uh, Landau photo of a dress that she submerged in the Dead Sea till it crystallized with salt. And then and then you have the Linda K. Alpern which is a, a f figure, a woman in a white uh, uh, slip, sort of floating, and, and it, it's interesting when I, uh, I, I, I've always thought of the, the uh, Alpern as having almost a kind of baptismal nature to it. Uh, you know, nature as, uh, as uh, purification of some kind, and then it's juxtaposed with this corrosive, abstract, you, you know, this co corrosive material uh, onto a dress that also the dress itself seems like it's stylistically, it's from another time. It's 19th century. 19th century outfit. Uh, and then, and then I was like, uh, almost had my head chopped off because uh, I was talking about the Sally Mann and I, I sort of along the lines of baptismal, you know, purification transcendent and April and, and some others were sitting there going, are you out of your mind? This is a death portrait. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a whole other, thing, you know, this is like child mortality, death, whatever. And I'm like, I can see that now. <laughs> You know, I was maybe not wanting to, I don't know. But anyway, the, those three f have a pretty incredible l dialogue with each other because I, I also think the Sally man's a little more open to interpretation than that, but, it, but they r resonate back and forth. Again, having to do with, uh, with nature, having to do with women in relationship to this thing called water. Uh, relationship to their own bodies and relationship to their, you know, child as an extension of the body, et cetera, et cetera. So. There's definitely something mythic going on upstairs. And one of the things I love about the Sally Mann is I, I think she looks like a Medusa's head with that hair, right. which seems to have a life of its own. Um, the wedding dress is really interesting because originally it was black. 
And so what the wonderful thing about the, the salt crystals sort of crystallizing upon it is it takes a black wedding dress and makes it white, which is, is just lovely about how it kind of, um, nature is almost trying to like normalize this uh, incredible garment for this sort of you know, important moment, uh, life-changing moment for uh, how it was made. Linda Alpern's uh, photograph is astonishing because the, it's headless and um, it's really beautiful. Um, the dress is wet, so one is very aware of, of her, the anatomy of her torso and especially her breasts. Um, and it, Linda has subsequently told us that the person who posed for this photograph was in her 70s. And there's something unbelievable about how that female body in water, to Robbie's point, kind of transcends age um, and these ideas of beauty. So it's, it's a really interesting and I think really complex works, which we never plan to hang in that way. I think that's mm -hmm. important to say. Yeah. I think also I had no idea she was 70 years old. Oh. That's, that's <laughs> pretty amazing. But... Um, do you want to talk about the Fred Wilson uh, yeah, glass I, pieces up there? Or, I, I or do. do you want to continue with no, no, Calypso? No, I, I would like to ask you a question. Ooh. Um, because you, you come, again, not just as an artist uh, to this and someone who has curated a lot of shows. And I'm interested if there are ways that you th like your work to be shown um, or lit or presented and if that is something which influence influences your ideas when you look at installing other people's work. Um, in, in terms of my own exhibitions, right? In, in terms or of your experience with your own in yeah. exhibitions, is that something that then informs when you install other artists' work? Um, I, I don't think so. I, I, in terms of my own work, I, I don't. I try not to participate in the installation of, of the pieces. I, I make one painting at a time, so I don't. I don't think, oh, this looks good next to this. This, these two are talking to each other. You know, they should have to go. Blah blah blah. I make one painting at a time. So. Uh, what I figure is people in a, a gallery or a museum context or whatever, they know their space so well that, you know, they'll, you know, unless they're out to destroy me. <laughs> which I, w I actually had this experience speaking of, uh, I, the one place, I, the one I, way I don't want my work shown is I, uh, uh, when I was a young artist, uh, early early 80s, I was included in a a, a big show at uh, at PS1, and this was like uh, you know one of these sort of markers in in you know your stepping stone career thing. To, to this was a big deal, a big name artist everywhere, etc. And I was in, invited to be a part of it. And I, I was doing at the time these works on glassine paper that were layered. Uh, so there was like a chair on one layer, a person on the other that you could put sitting on the chair. Or, you know, there was a lamp. There were, I would create these scenes, but they were just individual pieces of paper I collaged together that were transparent and, and pretty large scale. Uh, Anyway, so I was thrilled. I come with my rolled up bunch of uh, images. They point me to a wall. I go and I start to pin it up and, and then the curator comes and says they're rethinking um, and maybe we could move it over here. I unpin it <laughs> and I take it and I start pinning it there and then it comes over and goes, you know, we're actually th rethinking this whole thing. <laughs> could you go over here? And I go and I pin it, and, and I'm not even noticing that they're moving me out the door. <laughs> and and the, last, the last place they're giving me is in the hallway. <laughs> so other than that, I'm cool. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> A brutal art world. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, and, and uh, you know, when we've been installing, we've, you know, sort of preconceived what we thought of, we, we worked with a model of the uh, thing that we would sort of put things up, and then we get the work here and find that they're not talking to each other the way we thought they would, or they're, you know, there's something, you know, it dies in a certain way, and so we rearrange it. Um, and that physicality is something I love when I install. Um, I mean, we had thought about the Lando being down here in relationship to the Warhol or to the Bertinsky, and from a color standpoint, they just didn't work with each other, which was really interesting. And the Chrysophili, um, we initially had that piece over here. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it worked but the smaller wall gave it a little more intensity, and that was really exciting to see it. And there are times when, you know, you can just put a work on a wall, and it's like, you know it works. Um, and I think that in talking about the Thornton Dial, the John Alexander, and then between them, the Peyton Miller and the Scott Bluedorns, mm -hmm. we always knew we wanted the John Alexander and the uh, Thornton Dial. Dial in conversation, <coughs> but we knew we wanted something between them, and and that took some time for us to mm -hmm. kind of work out that conversation on that wall. Yeah. And uh, what do you think that conversation is? <laughs> well, so <laughs> I I think I th I think I think one of the things about that wall that I'm most pleased with, and um, I, I, I hope that the kind lenders who are in the room feel the same <laughs> way, is I love the way that all of these different blues work together mm. and, and sort of, it's not a harmonious wall, but there's something really uh, interesting in the way that um, this idea of water is, is, is brought out by that. And then I think that the, the Scott, Blue Dorns just, they bring a kind of lightness into it for visually that just for me really works. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I hope it works for you. Yeah, no, I love that. I love the sequencing of it. And I, I just had never really articulated what how they go together. I mean, we sort of knew the Alexander and the Dial, both sort of a similar size, but you know, blues, et cetera, would anchor the walls and then how to figure out what went between. But when you uh, look at the pieces, there's other sort of underlying connections that, you know, for example, there's, uh, there, there's a uh, sort of strange uh, post-apocalyptic depictions on these fragments of surfboard uh, plastic that uh, uh, Scott has found on the beach and then he drew into him in these very you know highly detailed slow make-believe places um, next to that the Peyton uh, Miller where where it's a you know sort of a reimagined uh, kind of experience slash confrontation with a whale that also looks like a freight train. Uh, so it's kind of a, an interesting sort of small abstraction of a much larger kind of event. The uh, um, John Alexander is the most sort of traditional in its depiction of, of water, but it actually is depicting something that you, you, you can't you can see it, but you can't capture it when you see it. Like it, you know, you have fish in, in, in churning sea. And you, you, we've seen them go. We go, ooh, look, oh, see all those, you know. But that, to actually stop time with that, mm -hmm. again, takes it to an, another place where it becomes not a descriptive of nature, natural event, but descriptive of a, almost a symbolic kind of relationship of, of uh, you know, animal or, you know, creature to place. And, and again, the, the Thornton Dial, which has, 
literally, you know, uh, things from the sea, the, the uh, oyster shells and stuff like that, and then this s strange uh, sort of emptiness in the middle. It, 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 empty is not quite the right word, but it, it's something where there's a, a, a non-descriptive physicality mm -hmm. to that center that is evocative. But again, unseen, uh, unseeable in a certain way. So. I mean, there's certainly appearance of two eyes, and then also of the flippers, and there may be a shell in there. But it, it's it's something which kind of um, I really appreciate the way it kind of comes into consciousness, but it can fade from consciousness too. Yeah. There's an unknowability about that painting, which I yeah I really love. I mean, we you know we. A lot of the way I respond to, I, I respond most directly to uh, handmade objects. And, uh, and I do so as a painter and as a sculptor. And I, I do so also because I understand the, the sort, of, uh, sort of quickly understand the decision making that the artist is going through as they put things together and take things out and you know you, you can read the painting in a very kind of clear uh, physical way but um, the, the, as a, a painter myself as an artist myself uh, living in the, these times coming through you know the, the ascendancy of you know high high conceptual art, uh, minimalist art, et cetera, et cetera, and then the, the explosion of pluralism within that that leads to a non-stylistic hierarchy uh, within it. You know, when, when, when I go back into my studio, what it takes to shut out everything that is here in order to, you know, kind of make the paintings I try to make. It, the, the things that, that I, I think all artists have to go through in this editing process to get to their own essentialness is, is spectacular in its scale of, you know, edit <laughs> down to. And, and, it, and so part of the, uh, thing that I see when I look at is uh, questions arise, uh, uh, you know, why, why, for example, historically within the modernist language, did we move to a kind of surface presence of the object? Like, like where the, the, the sheer physicality of something outweighs you know, that, that is to say the physicality, the making of it, the materiality of it, the gesturalness, the, the physicality of it outweighs the subject matter itself. That the, that the subject matter can hang on it, but, but that there's an impetus behind it. I mean, it's interesting when you, we talk about the Kiefer or the, or the Blechner here, which, you know, pull everything right up to a very physical present surface. Then you look at this photograph behind me, which is a, a, an artist, a, a photographer, trying to do something that absolutely goes against photography, which is to turn it into a flat abstraction as, a, as your initial uh, sort of experience of it, and then begin to see what it's actually capturing, which is you know an aerial view of a, a thing. But that that sort of incredible, sort of you know wanting wanting to bring it up to the surface. I mean, you have here with the with the Warhol a very literal, you know, on the surface kind what of. What you see is what you get. <laughs> what you did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the, the Thornton dial around the corner has that same sort of, the object is such a powerful, physical, literal, present, you know, surface kind of thing. And I, I don't know if the, the audience sort of takes that, those things for granted, but 
they're absolutely at the base of how an individual artist begins to make the thing that they make, where they're either, you know, sort of editing it out or, you know, uh, sort of reinforcing its illusion, playing around with that, the, the uh, Alexis Rockman back here, which is, one of the more illusionistic, you know, along with the, the Longo and stuff, but that thing of, you know, both creating a, 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 an immediate sort of illusionistic depth to it at the same time compositionally and visually putting it in two different places simultaneously, above and below water, or something you, you can't really physically experience in the, in the, at the scale that he's presenting it and stuff like that are all about shifting it from depth to surface and back again and so, um, yeah, you know, as opposed to the Cappy Emmetson who completely accepts the, the illusionistic, you know, the, that uh, painting's a window onto a world and. Yep. This is, probably a very good moment to open it up for questions and I think Jane has a question and Tom's going to give you the oh if um, both of you could speak to the video piece in the back there um, which I really love I mean I work with water and video um, but I'm flummoxed by the background ah um, so I love the water the movement the gush the, the, the piece she's referring to which you'll see you can see if you haven't already is uh, it's uh, done by this collective in Japan yeah. called Team, Team Lab. Team Lab, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it's a digital wave over what would appear to be a background of gold leaf. And for me, that really speaks to the Japanese tradition of um, folding screens and drawing over gold leaf. And so uh -huh. since you've got four monitors, it does look like there's a kind of accordionness to it. Um, that's so interesting. I did not pick up the gold leaf. Oh, that's leaf interesting. At mm. all. Yeah. It yeah. felt just like a, something blocking the, the back. Yeah. Huh. And of course, well, gold. That's my limitation. <laughs> no, but I mean, gold is, is, you know, so interesting. I mean, obviously in Japan, there's that tradition of drawing on gold. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously in early Christian art, the idea of heaven was gold, and so that's why in some of the early, well, late medieval, early, early Renaissance paintings, you have forms set against that gold background. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about that piece is that, for me, I, I, I thought it was a, a collage of a, a more, like a real water against the, the flattened gold leaf background as opposed to that it was a digitally produced drawing of water uh, with that level of, of fluidity and, and you know, organic uh, abstract you know, shapes is really so seductive. I mean, one of the reasons we put it back there was we knew that if we put it out here, no one would see anything else. <laughs> It, it, you know, it's, it's mesmerizing for one thing. And, and, and then we ended up turning that whole sort of room back there into the, the sort of the, the, the tech room. The what? The tech, tech room. room. The tech room, yeah. With the Jim Campbell and also with those and, uh, really the wonderful Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein. Yeah. I wanted to say, two things. One is that when you were talking about um, the Lauren Harris upstairs and the great tradition of early um, 20th century modernism and the way that abstraction emerged from that, if you take Robert Rosen Rosenblum's point, he has a whole theory about this, too long to say, that led to abstraction. But the abstraction of nature as a way of capturing something that's spiritual in a lot of that work to me including Arthur Dove and Charles Birchfield, I think is, um, you've mentioned the word cute, which made me wince, but, um, but to each his own. But to me, what's amazing about that work is that there's a very studied, very profound urge to animism in the work, and that there's a, there's a kind of an enlivening in the way that it's abstracted that for me has an absolutely profound impact on me spiritually. 
and it's where I think I come out of in my work, even though I don't abstract in the same ways. I'm more compositional and less like little mounded things that you could identify as being kind of from the actual history of animation itself. But I, th I think that that I think that their work is so extraordinary, and it is. You're absolutely right. I think so particularly American in so, that regard. So the reason I wor use the word cute, and I, 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 you know, there's a whole theory about um, Japanese art in the late 20th, early 21st century, which is about cuteness as a, a sort of assimilation, but also as a sort of celebration of things. And, you know, that's to do with anime, but that's to do a lot of different things. There's there's this relational aspect in Japanese art that that has been sort of summed up in the word of cuteness in in that specific context. And I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't mean that in any way, shape, or form as a dismissal of the work because the work is amazing. But there's there's a for me in that work there's a desire to somehow bring out a familiarity or to create a relationship with those objects that, that that seems like, and it's not something I've completely thought through, so it's really a preliminary idea, but that that is similar to that idea of cuteness, that idea of just a one-to-one -one relationship and a very individual relationship. Um, thanks. Anyway, um, but I also wanted to say that I think that the Jim Campbell is the most one of the most extraordinary pieces in this exhibition. Kudos to you for having found it and having included it because when I first walked into the tech room, I saw the I saw the team lab and I thought, that's pretty. And I still think that's pretty, but I don't love it. I don't get a charge out of it. But there's something about the that bare, weird, absolutely accurate. I mean in, in terms of being realistic, the actual light sparkle that's produced by those little diodes at the end of the the sticking out surface, I don't know how better to describe it, the actual effect of that is so unbelievably evocative of an indoor swimming pool with people jumping in and swimming through it. I just think it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. And speaking of animism, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great example of oat animism that is not really related to cartooning or, or like regular, you know, animism. It's but I think it's too, a fantastic because, uh, piece. You know, the Clifford Ross is a, a highly uh, realized, um, you know, digital photograph. Um, the Team Lab is highly realized digital electronics, whatever. The, the Campbell is, I, I remember when I first saw Campbell's work back in the 80s, and he was doing sort of variations along this thing of, uh, of these kind of LED things with a feed into them. Uh, one was uh, for the, at the Whitney Biennial where he was, the, the camera was out recording live, people walking on Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue and, uh, and fed directly into the museum. So you just see these people walking, you know, silhouetted through this LED field of, of lights. Anyway, they, they really, at that point, that was like highly evolved technological stuff. Now when you see it in relationship to the, uh, you know, even though these are better LED lights than, than back then, it's still a, a, a sort of earlier form of tech versus the team lab or, or even the, the Clifford. Uh, peace, etc., and uh, it's it becomes almost you know like handmade painterly, etc. Even though it's a tech thing, so. But then that gives you the delight of um, Eric, and I've talked about this many times. There's a there's a Bergman movie of the Magic Flute. Maybe you've all seen it, where there's a stage moment, and the and there's. There's a balloon, and there are, there are things that hang down from the ceiling. It's a kind of a stagecraft where everything is very exposed. And within the context of that movie, it's absolutely one of the mag most magical, realized, engrossing um, expressions within the movie. And that, I mean, that to me is what that piece does. It's 
you can you can see what it's made of so clearly, but it's so transcendent at the same time. I was curious about the title Empire of Water and where it, at what part of the trajectory of your curating it came about. And it's uh, very interesting in relation to the conversation. Yeah, I, uh, that was a, a title that uh, Sara came up with pretty much towards the end, right? Uh, we had, you know, several sort of working titles, uh, you know, I think starting off with that water thing. <laughs> you know, we're going to do that water thing, and, you know, that didn't sound quite like a title that, that did it. So, uh, uh, and, you know, Sara's, uh, she, she did uh, Road Rage as well. I mean, she's very good at titles, so. I mean, we were trying to find something which had all of the dis different aspects of water, um, the, the sort of power of nature. We wanted something which embodied power. We wanted something which embodied the complexity of politics. Um, we wanted something about the economics of water, especially being here, which is why the John Alexander was so important. Um, we, we wanted something that also had a mythical, all of those different things, we hope kind of came out in this idea of, of something majestic, something challenging, something complicated. So. Yeah, I mean, we tried things like realm, realm. right? Realm of water, so, you know, something that didn't have an edge to it. Yeah. Um, I forget what some of the other titles were. Oh, the Fred Wilson and the uh, Tomiko uh, Ode. So Fred Wilson, um, I you know, an, an astonishing artist. Um, he's really one of the first artists to come up with the, or be part of what we call institutional critique, which was when artists started to take on the institution of the museum and challenge ideas of neutrality and certainly of history. So the first project that he was really known for, and I forget the name of the institution, but he was asked to reinstall um, the collection of a uh, plantation home in the South. And, you know, it had incredible furniture and it had French, um, uh, 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 sorry, plates, and it had, you know, extraordinary, basically, implements for living. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm being so, but cutl cutlery, the, the plates, all of this kind of just, the glory, the art collection, um, this had been an unbelievably wealthy family, and this had been a family with enormous amount of taste. And um, all of this was on display, and Fred Wilson, as an African-American artist, basically said, sure, great taste, great wealth, did great things with it. However, you cannot show this cultural aspiration without um, showing the cultural and um, economic reality of this, which is slavery. So in a case of fine silver, he included slave manacles. Um, in a setup which showed Chippendale furnishing, furniture and uh, fine carpentry from Europe, he including a whipping, a whipping bench. Um, and so what he really did in this was to foreground the reality um, that, uh, you know, although it must have been an incredibly elegant way of life within the mansion itself, the historical reality of its basis should not be partitioned out outside of the house. And so um, later in the 90s, he represented the US in uh, uh, Venice, and he did some really wonderful things there. Um, he investigated uh, the idea of Othello, um, the sort of Moor in uh, uh, Venice, and he also investigated the Venetian obsession with um, what are called sort of lamps that are held up by Moors, by, by people of color. And at the same time, he produced his own uh, handbags, um, and he hired people to, to sell them on the street, which, of course, if you've been to Venice, especially in that time, you know, there were all these illegal knockoff handbags that were being sold, and there was this cat and mouse game between the sellers and, you know, the Italian police. But, of course, his sellers were selling authentic uh, 
Fred Wilson handbags. And so there was this kind of just street theater of all of this. And this is where Fred Wilson discovered Murano glass. And so all of the pieces upstairs are hand-blown glass. And they are not actually black. This is a type of red glass that Murano produces. But it's so dense it appears black. And so the, the idea between these series is that, you know, maybe it's oil, maybe it's tar, maybe it's blood, maybe it's sperm, maybe it's tears. But there's this idea of the viscosity. And, and again, this kind of overturning of the the antiseptic nature of the institution by, by allowing these materials to come down and look like they're kind of dirtying up the museum. There, there are little googly eyes up there on them, so they're really sweet and funny and um, sort of add these, these interesting aspects to the work. The dark red thief. The dark red thief, yeah, mm. yes. Tom, I think there's a lady over there. I just wanted to say how, how wonderful it is to have the word open in front of this place <laughs> and then walk into this without being charged a penny. It's just don't, don't an a one. The rest of these <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something? Um, our well, it's such a gift. And the quirkiness of your shows, the variety of the artists, and also, is, it's kind of like an assemblage of aesthetics, and it's condensed. It's within one space. And I very much enjoyed also the, the cards, um, because I like to know something about what I'm looking at. And there's all kinds of ways that we're being tugged into no cards, you know, or, you know, and I like the old-fashioned cards. They, they educate me, you know? And um, so I'm really moved by both these shows, and I wonder, are you thinking in terms of keeping a theme, like the road or the cars, and now water, and do you see in the future, what, what is the interest in a theme, a subject? And of course, I just wanna say that the variety from death to life to being at the bottom of a swimming pool watching dots and just being happy, you know, in this show is really moving. So thanks again. Well, I, I think obviously it's a huge thanks to Eric and to April for the gift of this institution. Um, I think that, you know, something that Eric and April have talked about since the very beginning is this idea of demystifying contemporary art and, and allowing people to come in. And as Eric mentioned a little earlier this evening, this idea of coming into to a show and knowing, having some way into it, such as water, such as, as, that has been important to us. So I think for the near future, we're very interested in continue to working in themes. And I should give a big plug to our summer show, which is going to be about how certain practices around weaving and fabric have moved into contemporary art. And that show will open just before July 4th. So again, that will be a thematic show. Um, and thank you for appreciating our quirkiness. I, I think we have to thank so many of our very generous and kind lenders. Um, and especially, um, I would like to personally just thank two local institutions, um, the Whaling Museum, which lent us the Kathy Anderson, and also um, the Shelter Island Historical Society, which lent us the Woolies uh, in, the, uh, in the staircase. Um, it's It's... It's really lovely to be able to borrow from these institutions and take those works and put them into a new context. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun, as it's been a lot of fun to always include artists who are working here locally in each one of our projects. Um, and sorry, Eric, what would you say? I, I would say that uh, we're having uh, wine and cheese downstairs. <laughs> and it might be a good time to April, what are you? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank you to both of you. Um, and thank you to everyone who came tonight. And uh, yeah, let's get some yeah. wine and cheese. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.